before he went to back to Australia. And it's just in, about interpersonal relationships with the Torah source and uh, the, the and examples. So it says verbal oppression. That's if we verbally abuse someone or we are verbally abused. Hopefully it's uh, well, hopefully it isn't either way around. The Torah prohibits such behaviors that aggrieve others, whether through business deception or through verbal abuse. In Vayikra, Leviticus, the Torah warns against fraudulent behavior in monetary transactions. And, and, the, and the quote is, when you make a sale to your fellow or make a purchase from the hand of your fellow, do not aggrieve one another. Immediately thereafter, the Torah uses the same verb, do not, do not aggrieve one another and you shall have fear of your God for I am Hashem your God. Referring to other forms of verbal abuse. The well-being member of Hashem Shem Raphael Hirsch explained that the root of, of the verb um, tonu signifies exploitation of naivety or ignorance of another for personal gain or amusement and has no equivalent in English. In this chapter, we will examine the prohibition of verbal abuse. Okay. Then it continues Rashi in Vayikra uh, chapter 25 says, the Torah warns us about verbal fraud, which entails that one should not verbally aggravate his fellow nor give him advice that is not appropriate for him. And you will say, and, and if you say, who knows if I had bad intentions when I gave the advice? This is what it says. You shall have fear of your God for the one who knows thoughts, he knows your intentions. Okay, let's just give, uh, okay, let's just continue here. Um, okay, let's just say direct insults and harsh words are considered blasphemy and defamation and not verbal abuse. Hurting, mocking, or degrading someone intentionally under the guise of reprimand, guidance, flattery, or friendship is considered verbal abuse, particularly when the victim is helpless. Now, I have suffered from this or been exposed to this by people during my life, which is and I don't know if you guys have the people abuse or mock or uh, bully, sure. bully, and then they, 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 and they try to give Musa to you. They think they're very from some people and they try to give Musa and they think they, it comes across as very arrogant. And unfortunately, only certain people should give Musa. And those people, I find, have always got, you can actually give them Musa about some. They've always got skeletons in their closet. So that's why I try to avoid doing that wherever possible, trying to give Musa to people. And um, it comes across sometimes very arrogant from some people. So uh, I'll continue. There's still more on this. We'll continue. At, um, I don't know. Have you guys had that type of abuse before? I'm sure. When you were younger, Gavin? Uh, I, I'm sure I have. Not, but listen, generally, if I had it, uh, I, I would probably flatten the hoax. So it <laughs> it never happened too. a second time. It never happened a second time. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, to be continued, eh? To be continued. This is the last chapter. That's the name of the book. Published in 2016. I found it in a bookshop in Beit Shemesh. It's a nice change. It's a nice change. And I read through it the first time. I didn't appreciate it. And I appreciate it. I looked at some of the stuff this afternoon. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, just want to finish off on 74B2 before the next Mishnah, and then we're going to do a review. Now, because by 9 o'clock proper, 5 to 9, actually, Kevin, let's just say 5 to 9, we're going to actually finish, is that if we don't carry on with the flow of the whole, um, we're doing more, uh, when we're doing the review, we, what I thought of, of doing instead of on a duff, just to get overall, so it doesn't slow us down further, the review of a whole Mishnah afterwards, just to see the continual pattern, which would be nice, but it doesn't have to be done necessarily in one junction, nor do we have to supersede time. So with that being said, let's just finish off the uh, the current duff before the next Mishnah, before we look at an analysis. Gav, I'm, mi I'm missing seeing you. I'm only seeing you. No, you only your eyes, Gav. That's it. That's it. Let me try to find something to rest it against, because it's tricky. I'll okay. sort it out. All right. So okay, yeah. sorted, sorted. Thank you. All right. So I'll tell you where, where we are up to. So the Gemara is looking at the current dispute between a buyer and Rava regarding contradiction being the beginning of Hazama. And it is in fact the subject of an earlier dispute. Uh, because if you have a look, um, we learned witnesses who testified that one person murdered another. Because you must remember, this is how the whole argument actually brought up. 
by Rava. He was talking about a case in Sanhedrin 27a. Okay. And um, what, what happened is this was part of an earlier discussion between whom? So it was between Rav Yochanan and Rav Elazar. So witnesses who testified that one person murdered another, who were first contradicted by one set of witnesses, and in the end rendered uh, conspiring witnesses by other witnesses. Rav Yochanan and Rav Elazar dispute the issue. One says they are executed. Or well, if you want to know the, the reason why, because although their testimony was invalidated and set aside because of contradiction before they were even rendered Zomamim, they are nevertheless treated and punished as Zomamim. And that's because contradiction is the beginning of Hazama, as Rabbi said. Okay. And then obviously the other one said they are not executed. Why? Because we don't say that contradiction is at the beginning of Hazama, so that when the two sets of witnesses contradicted each other, we cancelled out each of their testimonies. So if they were invalidated as witnesses and later witnesses said that they were not at this particular place, then it didn't matter if they were trying to conspire against the defendant. Their testimony was invalidated before doing so. Okay? So that's fairly straightforward. So we want to know who, which of the Amarayim uh, made which ruling. So it can be determined that Rav Elaza was the one who said that they are not executed. So obviously, therefore, he doesn't believe that contradiction is at the beginning of Hazama. And how we how do we know this? Because Rav Elaza said witnesses who were contradicted in regard to their testimony about taking of a life. In other words, they testified a person committing murder and were then contradicted. And uh, but in other words, guys, this is the thing to note according to Rashi. They were only contradicted. They weren't so, uh, exposed as conspiring witnesses. Their testimony was only contradicted. They receive lashes. So you might say, well, that's a little bit harsh, but it's in direct violation of the Torah's prohibition given, uh, against giving false testimony. Because we learned in Shmot chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not bear false witness. So although Rashi notes that the general principle is that one incurs lashes for violating negative commandments, um, in, look, if you look at this particular case, it might not be that they were officially Adam Zomamim. In other words, witnesses never came to turn around and say, you were not at this location when you testified to Rufan killing Shimon because then we would give them the death penalty. Guys, that's fairly clear. So in a case, sometimes it can be exposed that they're lying, but not about their whereabouts. So that's enough if they were caught that their testimony was false, but not that they weren't at that location. You can't give them the reciprocal death penalty, the Hazamah, but you can certainly give them lashes for bearing false witness. And believe me, that's mild. They try to put somebody to death. So if it should enter your mind that Rav Elaza is the one who said that witnesses who were contradicted and later exposed to Zomamim are executed, why do they receive lashes when they are contradicted but not proven to be Zomamim? Okay, because the prohibition for which they incur lashes, um, in other words, you shall not be, be a false witness, is the prohibition that was given to warn incurring um, against a death penalty. In other words, um, because they might still become subject to the death penalty for violating this prohibition. Because what happens, guys, if other witnesses come and expose them as ornament? So what we are saying is here, there is a fact that it could end up being Kim Labadi Rabamine. So what happens is, and the rule is any prohibition that was given to warn against incurring death penalty, what doesn't receive lashes for violating it, even in situations where there's no death penalty. So let me just explain to you what I mean by that. Um, because the Torah is in fact saying that execution by the court is the prescribed penalty for aiding Zomamim if you're caught con, uh, with other witnesses say you weren't at the event, not Mochus. So um, when, when there is a death penalty that is no, uh, not actually applicable, there's no punishment indicated. What are we saying is like, like this. Kim Labadi Rabba means uh, what? Kevin, what is it in concept? Um, Jeez. Think again, yeah, yeah. I mean, you went over it many times. Um, <laughs> I'm relaxed. I said it I can't, uh, can't give it over. 
All right, Kim Lepadi Rabbamin means that the lesser penalty is wavered in favor of the greater penalty, uh, which means any, any sort of monetary obligation that would incur lashes, we don't do the monetary obligation. Any lashes or monetary obligation which would occur, incur at the same time for the same prohibition that would incur a death penalty, the lesser penalty is wavered. If there are two capital uh, punishments, one more severe than the other, you know, there's stoning, there's beheading, there's burning, um, uh, there's um, by the sword. So for various death penalties, some are seen as more extreme than other. We can't kill the person twice, so the more severe one is given, and the lesser penalty is wavered. So what we are saying is here is Kim Lebedi Rabamine means that under the right circumstances, these false witnesses would be given the death penalty if other witnesses said you were not at the event. But in order to get the reciprocal penalty, they have to actually be caught out not being at the event to have witnessed the murder. Um, in absence of that, um, we don't give them the death penalty. They just get lashes for bearing false witness. Okay. So uh, that's, 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 that's one particular case. But there's also another concept of Kim Labadi Rabba Mine, which we learn in a case in Sanhedrin where a thief breaks in and tries to steal a barrel of wine. Now, at the time that he breaks into a house, his life is in danger because the homeowner's adrenaline is rushing and he doesn't know if the thief's going to kill him upon being confronted. So he kills the thief first. Now with the potential, it's kid labor de rubber me now, which means if the thief breaks the barrel while his life is in danger, he doesn't have to pay it back. Okay, why are we protecting the thief in that case where he doesn't have to pay for damages? I still don't know in Sanhedrin. It was something I asked of Simcha. It just was beyond me because the guy was guilty. But be that as it may, is that for the potential of cutting, of having to lose his life, uh, he is he, under the law of Kim Labor de Rabin Midday, which means any monetary offense while he's in danger is wavered. Even if he doesn't die as a result, in other words, he's not accosted by the homeowner. Why would the homeowner kill him? Because the homeowner doesn't know this guy's track record. Somebody's in your house, your adrenaline's rushing, of course you'd kill them before they kill you. So since that's the case, we say the barrel, uh, the thief doesn't have to pay for the barrel he smashed in accidentally even though it wasn't his. So, so to hear on the potential that there could be reciprocal win witnesses at the point where um, they're already having their testimony contradicted. You can see that there's something wrong. So if there's actually uh, witnesses that come late and say that weren't at this particular event, then in that particular case, um, they could get the reciprocal death penalty. In favor of that potential loss of life for the reciprocal penalty, we waiver the under Kim Labor de Rabbi Min May the lesser penalty, which means we waiver the lashes. So we don't apply the lashes anymore. So that's exactly the point. We know that since the lashes are wavered, that's a particular case. Um, um, where it's it's way, but even if one doesn't actually get the death penalty. So rather, do you not learn from this that Rabbi Elazar is the one who said that witnesses to a murder who were first contradicted and then exposed as Zomimim are not executed, meaning that since their violation of the prohibition against bearing false witness can no longer them render them liable to execution, once they've been contradicted, they can be punished with malchut on account of it. So in other words, this is a proof that Rabbi Elaza doesn't believe that once their testimony is contradicted, they can receive the death penalty because their testimony is invalidated. And in fact, since they can't receive the death penalty, they're now liable to receive lashes for bearing false witness. If he said that they could still be subject to the death penalty, even though the testimony is invalidated, uh, as, um, as does Rav Yochanan, we could quite easily see that Rav Yochanan holds in uh, um, basically that um, a contradiction is at the beginning of Hazama because he wavers the uh, Malchut because at that time, then, even though the, this testimony was contradicted, it still doesn't, in, uh, and it invalidates them as witnesses. If they prove later to be conspiring witnesses, they get the death penalty. And since they laugh, up until that point is in danger, 
they don't receive malchus, even if there's no witnesses that come against him, which proves, uh, according to Rav Yochanan, that he doesn't invalidate, even though the testimony is in, uh, invalidated, he doesn't waiver the reciprocal death penalty if they caught him as Adem Zomamim. So the Gemara concludes this indeed can be determined. So the Gemara basically questions Rav Elazar's ruling that witnesses who are contradicted receive lashes. So uh, how does Rav Elazar rule that they receive lashes? In other words, because it's saying, hang on, in this particular case, we see two different statements. One where Rav Elazar says that they don't receive lashes, and another one that says they do receive lashes. So they say, what's going on here? So he says, look, it's merely two different cases. The one case is that they invalidate it, and in that particular case, since they invalidated as witnesses, they're no longer subject to uh, Adem Zomamim um, conviction, so they receive lashes. In this other case, which we're going to deal with now, slightly different. So it's merely a case of two witnesses contradicting two witnesses. In other words, why do you see fit to rely on the second set of witnesses, rely still on the first set of witnesses? Now, this, guys, is different to the case of Adem Zomamim. Because there was a scriptural injunction that said, if there are first set of witnesses that said that they witnessed a crime, and a second set said they couldn't have been at that location, we believe in the second set. And even though they should cancel each other out by scriptural ordinance, we believe in the second set, except Rava applies that limitation to only from now on, the Dayu to that, whereas a buyer said it's rector actively uh, uh, disqualified. Okay? But in this particular case, we're saying, well, why are, do we believe the second set of witnesses? Because this isn't the case of Adam Zimmerman and Hazama. It's just two witnesses contradicting two witnesses. It's not where the second say, set say that the first set were not at that location. So there's no scriptural ordinance to believe the second set. In that particular case, uh, the question of the Gemara is, why believe the second set? There's no scriptural ordinance. If two witnesses are given an account of this particular event, and another two witnesses give a contradictory account. You know, basically, why do the uh, why when they contradicted do the first set of witnesses get the lashes, and we believe the second set because they should cancel each other out technically because there's no scriptural ordinance. I mean, who knows who's lying? So the Gemara said, look, this is an exceptional case. Is it's a bias said Ravelaza is referring to a case where the alleged murder victim came before us on his own two feet. Since he's demonstrably alive, there can be no doubt that the witnesses testified about lying to his murder. So what we are saying is here is that in fact it's almost a case of Adam Zumman when we believe the second witness, because they say he was killed in this altercation in order to. Uh, get the death penalty to an innocent defendant. And the guy crawls back to court, says, okay, he was beaten, but he wasn't killed. This guy doesn't deserve to die. And in that case, these witnesses uh, uh, stretched the truth a little bit further, intending to kill this victim, who in fact was a nasty individual and assaulted the guy, but he didn't kill him. So the person that they say killed, he said, no, I was merely assaulted. Now, the reason why we don't apply the reciprocal penalty to them uh, these false witnesses is twofold and only lashes. Number one, number one, it's one witness against two. So even if this one witness says they, uh, these two witnesses was, wasn't in that location, you can't convict on the testimony of one witness. You can throw the case out, perhaps, but not convict with a reciprocal death penalty, two, one against two. That's number one. Um, and, and number two, uh, is the fact of it is not saying they weren't in that location. He's just saying that the incident didn't happen with the severity that they expected. Maybe he wasn't beaten at all, for example, in which case they never lied about the location. They fabricated the whole event. But we don't give them the death penalty because it's still one uh, witness who was correct because he was the apparent victim, saying I'm alive and well. It's uh, They never killed me. So these guys are lying. And therefore, because it's not two witnesses against two, uh, we can apply a death penalty because you need two witnesses to apply any sort of penalty. And secondly, it's not a classic case of Adam Zomamim that he wasn't in the location. 
So, um, so the, the, the literal thing that we do is we give them lashes uh, because they bore false testimony. All right, guys. So that's the end of that particular duff. And so we can ask the Nish mission now. Yeah. Just a quick question. So this guy that 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 comes to laugh, right? I mean, surely he's he, even though he's one person, he's stronger than two witnesses. I mean, he's the actual person. He might be the actual person, but Gavin, there's still a due diligence process where he's the person. So that's why they get the lashes. That's how strong it is. Is that one against two? He, they still get the. Uh, the scriptural ordinance uh, again getting Malchus for bearing false testimony. So Gavin, you're right. This testimony is very strong, but not strong enough one against two to give them the reciprocal death penalty. Okay. okay. But because you can't. You can't in a death penalty case ever convict on one witness, even if that one witness is correct. All right. Yeah. No, 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 I do know that rule. I just thought maybe that in this particular case, because it was the, the actual guy who was who, who they're referring to is alive, it's it's kind of different. But um yeah, listen, it's 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 not different in the sense that um they probably but it is a bit more different. They wouldn't have got lashes otherwise. So. correct. So it's what you're saying is it's it's certainly different in the fact that we hold it so seriously that we uh, that we lash these two guys, they'll never do it again, believe me. They lashed within an inch of their life. Uh, so they're certainly not going to do it again. And it holds uh, credence because generally one can't go against two. But yeah, certainly, no, 100%. certainly not for a death penalty, that's for sure, even if it's correct. So I that's think good. that's a good point. Kev wanted to ask a question. No, I didn't. No, no, I didn't want to. Did, no. Okay, so uh, as far as that's concerned, uh, that's fine. So at least we've come to uh, the, the end of uh, that particular Mishnah. Now, what I can do is I can just do one of two things. I can either go to the next one, which I'm happy to do, or I can give you an overall, overall flow uh, of the last stuff. Uh, I don't know what you guys prefer. Whatever you prefer, just to get, give you a bit of a hint of how it unrolled itself. What do you guys prefer? I want to take a consensus. Uh, I think that role, that what you just... In the beginning of the duff, it actually started in, in the end of the 72nd duff in Bet, where the Gomorrah basically cites an Amorite dispute between uh, Zumamim conspiring witnesses. So it's been stated, one who testifies, and is subsequently found to be a conspiring witness, he's disqualified from serving as a witness retroactively from the moment he testified according to a buyer. But Rubber said he is disqualified from serving as a witness only from now and onward if he's found to be a Zomain. So the Gemara explains the grounds for the opinions. A buyer said he's disqualified retroactively because from the moment he testified, he became an evil deal uh, an evildoer from having testified uh, falsely. Because remember, guys, in Shemot chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not be a false witness. We just did that. And the Torah is stated, do not place an evildoer as a witness. So obviously it goes on for Shemot chapter 23, verse 1, that do not place your hand with an evil deer to be a corrupt witness. So obviously it says in the oral tradition, that this verse is going to bar any testimony of an evildoer. So clearly, that's retroactive. Okay. Now, Rava has a different opinion. He said he's disqualified only from this time onward because the discrediting of a witness that's a conspirer is a novelty. Why is it a novelty? Because if it, it actually constitutes an exception to the normal rules of evidence. Why? Because in reality, there are two witnesses against two witnesses. And what happens is they should, by logic, cancel each other out. Why should you believe the second set over the first set? So accordingly, what reason do you see to heed these second witnesses who testify that the first ones were somewhere else at the time of the incident? Heed instead those first witnesses who say they were present. Therefore, since the law that we believe the second witness and discredit the first ones as a novelty, because it's purely from the Chumash, you can only apply it from the time the novelty takes effect and onward. In other words, from the time that the witnesses are exposed as Zomamim, because 
um, um, you um, you can't go on logic here. You've got to go on the puzzle. Can therefore we supply a certain sort of limitation? Now, there's another rationale for Rubber's opinion. And there are those who say that Rubber actually also agrees with the buy-in principle that domain witnesses are really disqualified retroactively from the moment that he testified. And Rubber's other reason is uh, that they're only disqualified from now on is because of concern for the loss of purchasers who being unaware of his disqualification used him as a witness on their documents. So we say you go to Shul and you're having a transaction where you're selling your, your car and you just grab one of the guys from the Shul and say, please act as a witness. Now he's been embroiled as a false witness in some other case. And suddenly the other guy at the Shul has an issue with you regarding the car and says, well, um, basically, uh, uh, he's paid, uh, you know, there's a payment issue, etc., and that the deed of sale doesn't exist. And you say the deed of sale does exist. Now, if we uh, retroactively disqualify the witness, it's going to damage the purchaser. And as far as Torsford is concerned in all monetary cases, in those cases, we do not actively, um, we don't retroactively disqualify. However, um, in this particular case, it would seem, and according to the second opinion of Rubber, that we might retroactively uh, dismiss testimony within the same case. So that's one part I've got to speak to Rabbi Cohen about. Uh, but we understand why in other cases, according to the second answer. According to the first answer, even in this particular case, we don't retroactively disqualify. So in other words, the Gemara asks, what are the practical differences between these two explanations of Rubber's view? The first is where two witnesses testify against one of the original witnesses, and two other witnesses testify against the other one. In other words, it's not a case of two cancelling two out anymore. And in that particular case, um, there's not a rule of it being a novelty because two don't cancel out two. So what happens is, Two witnesses came and said that that witness um, is basically uh, lying and couldn't have seen the event. And two other witnesses uh, bring a case of the other witness and say he was also lying, he couldn't have seen the event. Now, those two witnesses that are conspiring are not really conspiring because they never claim to have seen the event together. What they claim is that maybe didn't like this guy and they said, no, he did such and such. But they each saw it from their bedroom window in a adjacent, uh, adjacent uh, apartment block, which means it's not two witnesses against two uh, backing each other up. It's just two against one and another two against one. So then it's not a novelty. Two against one, as Gavin knows, is uh, cancel, uh, cancels out the one. So since it's not an, a novelty, you can apply the disqualification retroactively. And another case is where uh, the second set disqualifies the first set on the basis of um, the character analysis. In other words, they're saying they were, uh, they were gamblers, professional gamblers, they committed robberies, etc. In either case, they're not saying that the witnesses are um, uh, conspiring. Uh, in other words, it's not a case of the, the witnesses, the first set of witnesses saying they saw the event and others said, said they couldn't have seen the event because they weren't there. So that's not a novelty. All they say about the first set is you can't believe that they've got bad character. They are the gambling addicts or they're robbers, etc. And therefore they're disqualified based on their character. Now that's not exactly a novelty because it's logical. Certain uh, uh, witnesses are just not eligible to testify because we don't trust them. Not because we believe the second set, but we can check out the characters in your repute. So in that case, it does affect um, uh, the first witnesses where they disqualify director actively. But according to the version that says Rubber's reason for not disqualifying a witness retroactively is because of the concern for the loss of purchases, that rationale is applicable to these cases as well. So Rubber would rule even in these cases, the first witnesses are not disqualified retroactively. Okay, so it's just bringing cases where Rubber's first version of what's brought, how it affects cases versus the second. Okay, so is everybody with me so far? It's pretty yeah, simple. So. 
Okay. Yeah. So Rav Yirmi of Difti said Rav Papa acted in a case that came before him in accordance with Rava's ruling. So Rav Papa obviously goes with Rava. Rav Ashi said the halacha follows a buyer. Okay, so uh, Rav Papa and Rav Ashi don't agree, but the Gemara basically concludes, and the halacha follows a buyer in this dispute with Rava in only six cases in the whole of Shas, including this case. In all other cases, we go with Rava, but in this case, we go with a buyer. And we remembered by the new mnemonic, uh, Yud Aleph Lamed Kuf Mim uh, Kuf Gimel Mim. So I'm not going to go into those other cases because it's just going to slow down the thought process of what we are dealing with. And Gavin, I, I think you and I, it makes sense that you retroactively disqualify because, as we've always said, how do you even believe these witnesses to start with? If they prove lying in the one case, why do we trust them in another? So we can understand why the halacha accords with the buyer, personally, yeah. uh, in our humble, stupid opinion, because uh, we're just not uh, Amoraim, uh, etc. We're not Tanoim. So the Gemara challenges a buyer's position from a Mishnah. Now, in our Mishnah, we learned if one stole an ox or sheep and was established by the testimony of two witnesses, and the fact that he slaughtered or sold the stolen animal was established by their testimony as well. So now that was, guys, we've got one group of witnesses that testify to two separate events. That is the, the stealing of the animal and then the slaughtering or selling of the animal. And then they were found to be conspiring witnesses, Adim Zomamim. They pay everything. In other words, the entire fourfold or fivefold payment. So they've got the double payment. He shall pay double the careful payment. And then uh, an additional twofold for a sheep or threefold for the ox as being exposed in Zomamim on the slaughter or sale. So that's where you get the four or fivefold payment. Now, is not the missionary referring to a case where they testified about the theft and then testified again about the slaughter? And they were subsequently rendered Adem Zomamim with respect to their testimony of their theft. And then they were rendered Zomamim with respect to their testimony on the slaughter. Now, guys, if it should enter your mind that a Zomaim witness is disqualified retroactively from the moment he gave his false testimony, then these witnesses, since they were rendered Zomamim on their testimony regarding the theft, it has been retroactively revealed that when they testified about the slaughter, they were actually disqualified from testifying. Then why do they pay for being Zomamim regarding the slaughter? So what we are saying is, according to a buyer, there's a bit of a problem. Because, uh, Kevin, if they are regarded as uh, uh, giving testimony, the same witnesses about the theft and the slaughter, and then they are found to be given um, false testimony regarding um, the theft, um, and it was retroactively revealed that then when they testified about the slaughter, they were actually disqualified for testifying why do they pay for being Zomamim on the slaughter? Why should they not have to pay on the slaughter? Yeah, that's what I want to ask you. They are only paying for the theft, not the slaughter. Is that what you say? Yes. And the Gomorrah is saying, in according to our mission, they pay for everything. They pay for everything. In other words, if they're caught lying, um, again, again. It's, okay, it's, so if it's... Okay, so... If, uh, why they're paying for the why, the why why shouldn't they pay for both? Why the, the five fold in, in total? Yes, because the, the double payment plus the plus the three plus the double payment for the theft and the and the payment for the slaughter or, 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 or the sale. Yes. Plus, you mean okay. So why shouldn't they pay for both? You're saying why because they? Because our, our Mishnah says they must. Our Mishnah says that if one. Oh, why are they paying for okay? Yeah. Um, because um, is it because if they were on uh, if they were going to say they're going to going to be if they if it was on the theft if, if it were, then it will be on the if you say what they they were found to be zomamim on the slaughter or the theft or the sale, which one okay so this is what the the mission is saying we have to pay if they were um, basically uh, if they were found to be uh, zomamim they pay for everything. Okay, now the Gomorrah is saying, look, if they testified about the theft and the slaughter, and they were found to be Zomamim on the theft, 
not on the slaughter part, on the theft part. Why are they made to pay for the slaughter? Because why shouldn't you pay for the slaughter, Gavin? Uh, I can't answer you today. Uh, sorry. No. Uh, I mean, Gavin, it's, it still seems unfair. If they only saw the theft, why should they pay on the, for the slaughter? Correct. But why should they pay? Why should they not pay for the slaughter? Then maybe answer that. Okay, because if they would have, if they would, if they were prepared to give false testimony on the theft, then they would have done it on the slaughter as well. Uh, no, there's, done a, both. there's a more fundamental reason. Why would I pay for slaughtering my own animal, selling my own animal? In other words, if the witnesses are lying about the theft, then the false yeah. witnesses have to pay the double payment for the theft. Now. Yeah. Why should they pay on the slaughter? Because the minute they try to get this defendant to pay on the slaughter, it was rendered retroactively that they were lying about the theft, which disables their testimony and invalidates their slaughter testimony. Because if they were lying about the theft, even if they wanted to make the defendant pay for the slaughter, they couldn't have because no theft took place. So since they couldn't um, effectively... Um, give false testimony about the slaughter because the theft was invalidated, why should they be made to pay for it? That's the question. Yeah, no, I battled this last time as well. Just uh, explain to us again, because it's, it's they shouldn't be. I, I felt the same last time as well. Exactly. Just give us some, I, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Just explain it, why they have to. I know they have to. Okay. So... With what are we dealing with here? When the case, when they were first rendered Zomamim on the slaughter and then rendered Zomamim on the theft, which means when they were exposed to Zomamim on the slaughter on Thursday and not exposed as Zomamim on the theft until Friday, at that time they were exposed on the slaughter. They hadn't been revealed that they'd been disqualified uh, when they testified about the theft. So they had to pay up front the threefold payment for the slaughter when they were caught up for that. After witnesses came and said they lied about the theft, then it's too late. They put their foot in it. So then they have to pay the twofold for the theft as well. If the testimony about the theft came without the testimony about the slaughter coming first, they'd be made only to pay the twofold, not the threefold. Okay? Yeah. So then the Gemara's got a problem with it. And that problem, Kevin, is as follows. They say, okay, but the, ch the challenge doesn't go away because in the final analysis... When they are later rendered Zomamim on the theft, it has been retroactively revealed that when they testified about the slaughter, they were actually disqualified from testifying. And why were they disqualified for testifying? Because although, uh, although they were convicted on Thursday of testifying falsely about the slaughter, they were not yet known to have been, been disqualified until they were exposed as Friday and Zomamim regarding the theft. So once the court realizes this track record, they were actually technically eligible to testify about the slaughter. So that commandment for payment should be rescinded because they weren't validated witnesses. Their own testimony regarding the theft contradicted them, and therefore it should have broken the testimony where they don't pay for the slaughter in any event, which is what Gavin mentioned last time. You remember, Gav? Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't break it, you said. I remember last time it as well. It doesn't. And the reason being is the Gomorrah answers the law is that the ruling stated in the Mishnah applies only when they testify with respect to the theft and the slaughter at one time. And we subsequently uh, rendered them Zomamim on both the theft and the slaughter. In other words, if, uh, if they testified at two different time junctures, then in that particular case, it's seen as two separate testimonies. So uh, if they were caught in the one testimony, lying about the theft, and then afterwards about the slaughter, the uh, theft testimony disables them having to pay for the slaughter because that uh, the witnesses are invalidated from a slaughter claim once they were exposed as lying about the theft, despite the order. So what happens is if it's in one utterance, just let me finish, if, if they testified one time juncture, they kind of put their foot in their mouth and they have to make the fivefold payment because it's seen as one testimony, not as two separate testimonies. 
What are you going to say, Kev? I'm listening. So to this you. is a correlation to the tooth and, and the eye. It will become whole... that. Uh, it will become that. It will become that exactly. So, for example, the witnesses testified on Tuesday, Kevin, that the defendant stole the animal on Sunday and slaughtered it on a Monday. So since they testified about the theft and the slaughter on the Tuesday at one juncture, if we disqualify them retroactively for their testimony about the theft, they're still considered to have been qualified witnesses at the time they testified about the slaughter, because it was one statement. And because they said it in one statement, and there's an inconsistency, and they were found not to be at the one location, they are given, uh, uh, they have to pay the fivefold payment in one go. But if they spoke at two different testimonies, the testimonies are separated. And then if they made false from the theft, they don't have to pay for the slaughter because it disenabled their slaughter testimony. Okay? So the Gemara suggests that obviously exactly that, it's a dispute between a buyer and rubber. It might be a tonight dispute because we learned in a price, if there were two witnesses testifying about him that he stole, and they themselves also testified him that he slaughtered the stolen animal, and they were subsequently rendered Zomimim on the theft, their testimony, which became partially invalidated, is totally invalidated, which is what Gavin said. If it's the same set of witnesses, uh, how can you believe them about the th uh, slaughtering if they lied about the theft? So, um, however, they were rendered Zomimim on the slaughter, but not the theft. The defendant pays the twofold payment. Why? Because, Gavin, if they were rendered Zomimim on the slaughter, but not the theft, even though they might be lying, as far as that's concerned, uh, unless there's evidence to the contrary, the defendant pays the twofold payment. But the Adam Zomimim pay the threefold payment regarding the slaughter. Rav Yossi said in regard to what was the last ruling said, in regard to two sets of witnesses, one testifying to the theft and another set testifying to the slaughter. But in regard to one set of witnesses who testified to both the theft and the slaughter, it's exactly as Gavin said, that even though they were found Zomimim only on the slaughter, their testimony, which is partially invalidated, is totally invalidated. So when you read this superficially, it's saying, guys, if there are two sets of witnesses, one testifying to the slaughter and one testifying to the theft. If they were testified to the slaughter and there were two different sets of people, we can't say that the first set, which are different people, are lying. So that's one case. Uh, so obviously, uh, if it's one set of witnesses that are lying to the slaughter, um, uh, as Rav Yossi said, then at the end of the day, we don't trust their testimony regarding the theft because it's the same people. That's a superficial reading of the uh, of the pricer, which is what Gavin mentioned to us last week. Do you remember, Gavin, your point? Yeah, yeah. So it's saying, look, if you're reading that, you're reading it too simply because it suggests that Rav Yossi is differentiating between testimonies regarding the theft and slaughter given by two different sets of witnesses and testimonies given by the same set of witnesses. So the Gemara proceeds to demonstrate that that is an oversimplification and can't be. So what does Rav Yossi mean when he says two sets of witnesses? And what does he mean when he says one set of witnesses? If you're going to say that two sets of witnesses, guys, is literally two separate sets of witnesses, one group testifies to the theft, another to the slaughter, and a separate uh, case is where one set of witnesses means it's the same single group of witnesses who testify to both crimes, but with one testimony at two separate time junctures. If so, Rav Yossi is saying that there's only one set of witnesses, like a single group testifying to both the theft and the slaughter, one testimony coming after each other. When they testify to the theft and later they testify to the slaughter, when they're rendered Zumamim on the slaughter, you say the testimony which has become partially invalidated is totally invalidated, and they were rendered Zumamim on the theft as well. Uh, in other words, what we're saying is that when the Hazama witnesses come and say that the, to the original witnesses, you couldn't have seen the slaughter on Monday, because you were with us on Monday in a different place, they rendered them Zumamim in regard to the testimony they gave about the theft on Sunday as well. 
The only thing of it is, though, Gavin, we don't apply the reciprocal penalty with regard to the theft because they haven't been proving lying from there. They're just proving that they can't be trusted. So the defendant wouldn't pay, but they won't have to pay the double in the theft because they weren't proven agents on them on there. We just don't trust them as far as that's concerned. But the Kimura is saying this is a bit of a problem. Why? Because there can't be a basis for saying this. What do they mean? Is that literally, how do you derive this? The fact that they lied about their whereabouts on Monday doesn't prove that they lied about their whereabouts on Sunday as well. So what we're saying is, yes, Gavin's right. They probably were liars. But you, unless you can prove it, you can't, uh, you can't throw their testimony out. In other words, the defense has to have a reasonable uh, case as well. So they can only be proven Zomimim and made to pay the reciprocal payment on the parts that they were caught that they weren't there about the whereabouts. But where they weren't proven to be false, we have to accept the testimony unless it can be proven otherwise. Because they could have been lying for all sorts of reasons. They could have been lying because they were doing, um, they might have, that, that might have nothing to do with the case, as we explained about the one guy having an affair, uh, et cetera. So the Gomorrah, and we're going to end off on this note, the Gomorrah explains Rav Yossi's statement differently. When Rav Yossi speaks of two sets of witnesses, he's referring to one set of witnesses, Kevin, that is like two sets. In what way is this one set of witnesses like two sets? in that one group of witnesses testified about the theft and slaughter with one testimony at two different times. So what Rav Yossi is saying is that they're coming on the one day to testify about the theft and another day about the slaughter. So when they found Zomimim regarding the slaughter, the earlier testimony regarding the theft remains valid because it's a different testimony. But if the same set of witnesses made a testimony at one time juncture and they were exposed as Zomimim regarding the slaughter, their testimony on the theft doesn't remain valid because it's, it's struck off the roll. It's one long statement. And we're going to end off on that note. Down ah, okay. God, thanks. Is it making so, more sense now? Yeah. We can't give yeah. it over like you can, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. You no, we can't. No, 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 we can't. No, no, no we right. can't.